Testing. Good morning, let's stand and sing the song Offering. I love this song, this has a Christmas flavor. The song Offering, lift your voices in praise to our Lord this morning for He
appeared a star While angels sang to lowly shepherds Three wise men seeking truth They traveled from afar Hoping to find a child from heaven Falling on their knees They bowed before the humble Prince of Peace I bring an offering of worship to my King No one on earth deserves the praises that I see Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due I bring an offering to you. Lord, we bring an offering to you. Our time, our talents, our resources, our finances. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. Sources, finances, for you are worthy, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Alpha, Omega, the beginning, the end, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and his name shall be called Wonderful. And all God's people said, Are you glad you're here today? Are you enjoying the Christmas season? Are you eating too much? Yeah, we all do around this time. We had a uh, breakfast fellowship in my class this morning, and if you're not in my class, are you jealous? Um, we had a breakfast fellowship, and, and I had to really restrain myself because it's really hard to sing and preach after eating a lot, so I did, I did pretty well. There's a lot of good food over there. Love this time of the year. Appreciate your presence. This truly is the most wonderful time of the year because we're celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we just want to praise you today for the gift of your Son. We're reminded of what the Apostle Paul said, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Lord, we are so appreciative for the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, who came so innocently as a little lamb, born in a manger, lived a sinless life, died a substitutionary sacrificial death to pay for our sins that we might have everlasting life, and then prove that he was the one that he claimed to be by coming forth from the grave, Lord, so much wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. We pray that in the service today you might be honored in every sense of the word. 
for it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's say our memory verse today, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Those who are visiting with us, thank you for your presence today. I know that we have some visitors. Some people are here uh, for the children, and that's understandable. We all love to see children sing around Christmas time, and so we're looking forward to that. We trust that you'll receive a blessing. If you did not receive a welcome packet, lift your hand. Anyone who did not receive a welcome packet, the ushers will serve you. On the inside of the welcome packet, there is a card. If you would, just fill that out completely. You can hold on to the card to the end of the service. At the end of the service, my wife and I will be at the back. We want to meet you and chat with you and get to know you a little bit better. We thank you for coming today. Trust that this service will be a blessing to you and that this will make Christmas even more meaningful to you here at Bible Baptist Church. We appreciate so much you being with us today. You may be seated. And we love this time of the year for many reasons, and we love to hear the children sing, and, and they usually have a drama. I want to say that this year was different uh, just like last year. Um, because we're still dealing with that C word, right? Still dealing with the C word and the Q word. Um, so, you know, we have, we've had sickness, we've had people um, quarantining and so forth, and so the children are not able to do the drama, and that's a little disappointing to them and disappointing to us to an extent. So we had a decision to make. Do we have them just go ahead and do the songs or perhaps just push this on into the new year. Well, it is a Christmas program, right? So this is the Sunday before Christmas. So the decision was, uh, after talking with Malia and Melissa and so forth, those who have been working with the children, was for them to just do the songs today. So they're just going to sing the Christmas songs from the program. There will not be a drama, but we are looking forward to hearing them sing. Nothing like the energy uh, the enthusiasm of little children. So we're so looking forward to this program. The title of the program, The Wonder of Christmas. Let's give a warm welcome to the children of Bible Baptist Church.
Good job. Good job. Good job. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, children. We appreciate that. Love Christmas music. Appreciate Malia and Melissa and the workers, those who help them, and appreciate the children. Appreciate that so much. All right, I want us all to stand. We're going to sing Silent Night, Holy Night. You know this song. Let's sing all the verses. Silent Night. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin, mother and child, holy infant so Sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace, silent night, holy night, shepherds quake at the sight glory stream from heaven afar heavenly hosts sing hallelujah Christ the Savior is born Christ the Savior Silent night, holy night, wondrous star, lend thy light with the angels, let us sing. the Savior is born, Christ the Savior is born, silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, Radiant beams from thy holy face With the dawn of redeeming grace Jesus, Lord, at thy birth Jesus, Lord, at thy birth may be seated. I want you to sing with me a couple of songs I've been singing all of my life, and everyone in here, most everyone should know these songs, beginning with Jesus Loves Me, just a cappella. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. I've been singing these songs all of my life, but I have to admit that I, as a child, I did not understand the full meaning of these songs. However, However, I did know the main subject of these songs, the one whose birth we celebrate this coming Saturday morning, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the time of the year that uh, we pull the decorations down from the attic or from the basement or from some storage area, and we decorate our homes beautifully. My wife always does such a wonderful job with that. This is the time of the year that we enjoy Christmas lights. I was able to do that this past week with the church family. Enjoyed that very much. This is the time of the year that we enjoy Christmas festivities and Christmas music, as we heard this morning from the children. This is the time of the year. People are generally in a better mood. Are you in a better mood? Generally, people are in a better mood this time of the year. It truly is the most wonderful time of the year, but not simply for the reasons noted in the song. It's the most wonderful time of the year because this is the time, once again, when we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we're going to focus on Christ in the message today. I cannot help but wonder how many people will celebrate Christmas this coming Saturday but not yet really understand what Christmas is all about. You have such distorted views of Jesus Christ that exist in the world, such as you have people who believe that he was simply a great person worthy of emulation. And yes, he was a great person worthy of emulation, but to say that he was simply a great person worthy of emulation is mistaken identity. You have some who say, oh, he was a great prophet, and yes, he was a great prophet, but to say that he was simply a great prophet is mistaken identity. And you have others who say, oh, he was a martyr who died for a cause, and yes, he died for a cause, but to say that he was simply one who died for a cause is mistaken identity. I want you to understand that Isaiah gives us the correct identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah Look down the hallway of time over 700 years before Christ was born. And he gave us this great verse. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So Isaiah said that something miraculous is going to happen. A virgin will conceive, that's miraculous, and she will give birth to a child. And that child will be unlike any other child in all of human history. That, that child will be Emmanuel, God with us. And I propose to you today that Jesus was not simply a person worthy of emulation. I propose to you today that Jesus was not simply a great prophet. I propose to you today that Jesus Christ was not simply one who died for a cause. I propose to you today that Jesus Christ was, is, and shall forever be God. Jesus said that he was God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, I and my Father are one. He allowed people to worship him. He said that he had the power to forgive sin. And Jesus also said that he was the only means of salvation. John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Why should we believe Jesus? Why not believe other world religious leaders throughout history? Jesus conquered death. He came out of the grave. Only God would have power over death. And so Jesus proved he was the one that he claimed to be, God in flesh, and the only means of salvation by coming forth from the grave. We celebrate that, obviously, at Easter time. And I want you to understand that all the other world religious leaders throughout history, they are still in the grave, but Jesus is alive. And he's at the right hand of the throne of God. And so today I present to you, I present to you the correct identity of Jesus Christ. The title of the message, 
his unmistaken identity, and we're going to be looking at Jesus Christ in a very strong way for the next few minutes. Father, I pray you'll bless today as we look at the most important person in all of human history, the Lord Jesus Christ, God in flesh, who came to this earth as a little baby, who lived a sinless life, who went to the cross, who died on the cross, who came out of the grave, who is one day coming back for his own. I pray, Lord, that today, I pray you will be honored in every sense of the word. We want Jesus Christ to be lifted up. We pray if we have those in our midst who have not trusted Christ, that today might be the day of their salvation. Work in hearts and lives as only you can. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We're going to answer several questions today in reference to Christ. Who, what, and why? So who is Christ? Have you ever considered all of the titles of Christ in Scripture? Watch this. Who is Jesus? He's the one that Isaiah was referencing once again in Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. 
He's the one that Micah was referencing in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Hundreds of years before Christ was born, Micah told us exactly where Christ would be born. But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, who is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. He's the one that Isaiah was referencing in Isaiah chapter 53. For you see, Isaiah did not simply prophesy of the birth of Christ. He also prophesied of the crucifixion. Read Isaiah chapter 53. Such verses as verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and well acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised. And we esteemed him not. Verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we were healed. Verse 7, he was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He is the one that... John was referencing in John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14, and the Word, God, was made flesh, Jesus, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is the one John was referencing in John chapter 3 and verse 16. The whole Bible in one verse, the most important verse in the Bible, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 36, he that believeth on the Son hath life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. He is the one whom John records as saying in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. He is the one whom John records as saying in John 6, 47, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He is the one whom John records as saying in John 12 and verse 46, I am come a light into the world that men should not abide in darkness. He is the one that Paul was referencing in Romans 8. I love this passage. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's the one that Paul was referencing in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is the one that John was referencing in Revelation chapter 5, the most magnificent worship scene in all of Scripture. John is caught up into the third heaven. He is given a front row seat to future events, events yet future to us. And John is weeping because there's a seven-sealed book that has to be opened in order for tribulation events to occur, in order ultimately For the millennial reign of Christ to be a reality, Jesus Christ ruling and reigning on this earth as we are taught in Scripture for a thousand years from Jerusalem. So John is weeping because he perceives no one is worthy to open this seven-sealed book. But then he is told, John, there is one who is worthy, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, a reference to Jesus Christ, not simply an innocent, meek, mild lamb. He's called the Lamb of God. We know that. But he's also referenced as a conquering lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So John, who is overwhelmed with sorrow and sadness because he thinks no one is worthy to open this book, culminating in Jesus Christ ruling and reigning on this earth, the Bible says he's told there is one worthy, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the Bible says a lamb stood That's Christ. Read Revelation 5. A lamb stood, listen, that had been slain. A lamb stood that had been slain. You see, he's alive. He came out of the grave. 
So the Bible says, a lamb stood that had been slain, and he takes up to receive this, he steps up to receive this seven-sealed book. And there's an absolute explosion of praise that takes place. The Bible says the four living creatures who are around the throne of God, their sole purpose is to praise God for eternity. They are joined by the 24 elders, whom I believe represent all believers of the New Testament age. And they are joined by angels. We are told 10,000 times 10,000, 100 million strong. And they are joined by every creature in earth, in heaven, under the earth, we are told. And they all begin to sing, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessing. Worthy is the Lamb. A magnificent explosion of praise that takes place in Revelation chapter 5 that is yet future to us. Who is Jesus? He's the one I'm referencing right now. Who is Jesus? He's the one Oliver B. Holden was referencing when he wrote the great song, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all. Who is Jesus? He's the one that Avius B. Christensen was referencing when he wrote the song, Blessed Redeemer. Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walked Christ my Savior, weary and worn. Facing for sinners, death on the cross, that he might save them from endless loss. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, four sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. He is the one that John W. Peterson was referencing when he wrote the great song, Isn't the Love of Jesus Something Wonderful? There will never be a sweeter story, story of the Savior's love divine, love that brought him from the realms of glory just to save a sinful soul like mine. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me. He is the one that Robert Lowry was referencing when he wrote the great song, Christ Arose, Low in the Grave He, he Lay. Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day. Jesus, my Lord. Vainly they sealed the dead. Jesus, my Savior. Vainly they watched his bed. Jesus, my Lord. Death could not keep its prey. Jesus, my Savior, He tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave He arose with a mighty triumph o'er His foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain, and He lives forever with His saints to reign. He arose, He arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. He is the one Alfred Ackley was referencing when he wrote the song, He Lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, and I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. You know, in this day and age when people get so excited about so many things, they get excited because their team wins. And I love sports, okay? I get excited myself, okay? But uh, we get excited because our team wins. We get excited because uh, we get a new house. We get excited because we get a new car. Uh, we're excited because uh, we, we have new clothes. We're excited about so many things. It is time for those of us who know and love Jesus Christ to be excited about that which is most important, and that is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So today here at Bible Baptist Church, we're going to be excited about Jesus. Three cheers for Jesus today at Bible Baptist Church. We're not just going to be excited about our team winning or getting a new house or a new car or new clothes or a raise at work. We're going to be excited about that which is most important, the one whose birth we celebrate in just a few days, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Who is Jesus? There's another question we want to answer. What? What is Jesus? You know, the angel, when Christ was born, said this. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. 
And I know there are a lot of people in this world who really do not believe they need a Savior. And perhaps you're in the room today. Perhaps you don't see yourself as needing a Savior. And I say this to you respectfully. You may, you may believe that. You may sincerely believe that. But can I say this to you respectfully? You are sincerely wrong. Because everyone needs a Savior. But Pastor, I'm a good person. Hold on a second. If we could work our way into heaven, why would Jesus have died on the cross? Let me remind you of John chapter 3. Classic, classic passage in Scripture showing that religion does not take anyone to heaven. Do you know that the path to eternal damnation is littered with religious people? The Bible says this, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way, which leadeth unto destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life. And listen, few there be that find it. There are many people believing they can get into heaven through religiosity. Jesus, Jesus taught just the opposite. In fact, if you go to John chapter 3, you read about a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, the strictest sect of the Jews. And Nicodemus was a very religious man. He was religious to the hilt. And he goes to Jesus Christ at nighttime. Why does he go to him at nighttime? I believe he went to him at nighttime because he did not want his colleagues, the Pharisees, to see him with Jesus Christ because the message of the Pharisees was opposite the message of Jesus Christ. You see, their message was the message of religion. You can cleanse yourself. You can make yourself acceptable before God. All you need to do is tap into that innate goodness. All you need to do is obey Old Testament law, and you can make yourself acceptable before God. Nicodemus was in the number of the Pharisees. He's a religious man. He goes to Jesus at night. The message of Jesus was just the opposite. The message of Jesus was, your only hope is the one who will ultimately die on a cross, referencing himself. That's your only hope, and you need a Savior. That was the message of Jesus to Nicodemus. So Jesus is having this conversation with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus says, no one can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. And Jesus said to him, you must be born again. Nicodemus did not know what Jesus meant by that. He said, what do you mean? Do you mean go back into my mother's womb and be born? And Jesus rebuked him in so many words. Jesus said to him, you mean to tell me you're a teacher in Israel? You don't even know what it means to be born again. And then Jesus, knowing that he was well-versed, knowing that Nicodemus was well-versed in the Old Testament, the Old Testament law, he takes him back to the fourth book of the Bible, the book of Numbers. He takes him back to the account where the Israelites were bitten by snakes. And God told Moses, I want you to take a pole, put a brazen serpent on the top of that pole, and tell the Israelites they have to look in order to live physically. By the way, I've said this many times, you see that same symbol on ambulances. The next time you see an ambulance, look for it. A lot of people want to totally remove biblical influence upon society. Not going to happen. It's all over the place, even on the side of an ambulance. It's from the book of Numbers. So God told Moses, he said, I want you to take a pole, put a brazen serpent on the top of that pole, and tell, tell the people who've been bitten by these snakes, they have to look in order to live physically. Nicodemus knew that, that very well. And then Jesus uttered some of the most potent, powerful words that ever came out of his mouth. You talk about to the point. Jesus looked at Nicodemus because Nicodemus, he knew about that account in the book of Numbers, the brazen serpent, people having to look to live physically. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. See, that's one of the titles of Jesus, Son of Man. He's called the Son of God. He's called the Son of Man, the God-man, right? So Jesus said, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And he's talking about himself. And where was he lifted up? On the cross. Next verse in John chapter 3, read it. It's, it's a fascinating passage. The next verse, Jesus says to Nicodemus, that whosoever believeth in him, the Son of Man, the Son of God, should not perish. 
but have eternal life. And then the very next verse is that verse we've already quoted. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here's what Jesus told that religious man by the name of Nicodemus so many years ago, thousands of years ago. He said, Nicodemus, if you want to live spiritually, you have to look to the one lifted up on the cross. Religion is not going to cleanse you. Religion is not going to merit salvation for you. Nicodemus, you need a Savior. That's what he told him. And the message is the same today. See, we still have the message of religion. I'm sure there are people who come to our church who think that you're going to heaven because you've been a member here all of your life. I say this to you as kindly as I can. You can be a member here. I can preach for the rest of my life here at Bible Baptist Church and still not go to heaven. There has to be a time in my life, in your life, when we understand that we need a Savior. But, Pastor, I'm a decent person. I'm a moral person. People think I'm this good person, and perhaps they do. Perhaps you have a semblance of morality. Perhaps you have a semblance of decency. Perhaps you have a semblance of goodness. Perhaps people look at you and say, oh, such a good person, such a kind person, such a compassionate person, such a helpful person. You may be good as we define good, humanly speaking but you're not good enough. Pastor, that's an insult. No, I'm not good enough either. I've served as a pastor for decades, over three decades, but I'm not good enough. So don't take it as an insult. I'm saying this to everyone. No one's good enough. No one's good enough. Let me remind you in Matthew chapter 7, another fascinating account. You have people standing at the great white throne judgment. You see, people stand at this judgment, and who is at the judgment? Who is seated at the right hand of God in Scripture? And who is at, who is, who is at the great white throne judgment, and who is at the judgment seat of Christ? Well, the Bible says God the Father hath committed all judgment to God the Son. So Jesus Christ is seated at the judgment for believers, which is the judgment seat of Christ. And he's also seated at the great white throne judgment, which is the judgment for unbelievers. So in Matthew chapter 7, you have an account of the great white throne judgment. You have individuals who do not uh, know Christ as Savior. Perhaps they are religious, but they never trusted Christ as Savior. They stand before the Lord. In fact, all unbelievers stand before the Lord. And they look into the eyes of the one who shed his blood for them, And they are being condemned to eternal separation from God in a literal place the Bible calls hell. It is described as a lake of fire. And they object. Jesus, Jesus, wait a minute. This is is not right. You're, You're wrong about this. You're wrong in condemning me. I mean, I did wonderful works in your name. I prophesied in your name. I was a pastor. I was a deacon. I helped people. I fed people like Mother Teresa. I did all of these wonderful things for people. And Jesus looked. Some of the saddest words in all of Scripture, he looked at them and he says, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Saddest words. Because there's going to be so many church-going people who hear those words. People in this room. I don't know who. But you're trusting in your good works. You're trusting in your goodness. You say, Pastor, why can't we make it in based on our goodness? Good question. God demands perfection. He does. That's what the Scripture teaches. We cannot live eternally in the manifested presence of God unless... Our sins are completely washed away unless we are declared perfect by God himself. That's the only way. And he told us how how we can be declared perfect, how we can be cleansed of our sins. Pastor, you don't understand. I'm, I'm this good person once again. I'm not doubting that, humanly speaking. But man has laws, and if you break those laws, you can be fined, you can be imprisoned in certain states, and for certain crimes, you can be put to death. God has laws. The ultimate penalty... For breaking God's laws is eternal separation from God forever. And newsflash, we have all, we have all, we have all, we have all broken God's laws. Every single person listening to me and every single person in this world, no matter how good, no matter how 
decent, no matter how moral you perceive yourself to be, you've broken God's laws. Well, I don't know about that, Pastor. Okay, let's talk about it a little bit. How many times do you think that you've sinned? A couple of times, ten times, a hundred times? Newsflash, every single person in this room has sinned thousands of times. What do you mean? Okay, let's delve into it very briefly. How many times have we done things that God has told us not to do? One example, how many times have you lied? We're not supposed to lie. How many times have you lied? Well, well, that's not that bad. God says that's his standard. No deception. How many times have you lied? Okay, there are sins of omission. One example, God says that we are to gather together consistently as we are doing today. This does not merit salvation, but this is a command for believers. We are to gather together consistently. How many, not simply am I referencing unbelievers, but how many professing believers think nothing about breaking that command? Well, it's not that bad. Oh, yes, it is. It's sin. It's sin. That's the sin of omission, not doing what God has commanded us to do. And then you have sins of the Spirit, you know, hateful thoughts and lustful thoughts. And I'm telling you, every single one of us, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And there's nothing we can do to cleanse ourselves. Even, as I've said in previous messages, if you went the rest of your life not sinning one more time, you still could not cleanse yourself of all the sins that you've done up until the point that you started living a life of perfection. We know that's not realistic. But if somehow you could live a life of perfection from now until the day you die, there's nothing you can do that will erase all of the sins of your past. And God's Word is clear. All of those sins have to be washed away. They have to be cleansed, and he has to declare you perfect in order for you to enter into his presence. Well, well, there, there's many ways. There's many ways to heaven. I know that's politically correct. I know that that is easy on the ears. I know that's palatable, but that is not what the scripture teaches, and that is not what Jesus said. Once again, I'm going to quote it, John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There are not many ways to God. There's only one way, the one whose birth we celebrate this coming Saturday. It's not Confucius. It's not Muhammad. It's not Buddha. It's the one whose birth we celebrate this coming. Well, how do we know that? I mean, how can, why would you believe him? I've already answered that. He came out of the grave. He conquered death. Only God would have power over death. The other world religious leaders throughout history, they're in the grave. Jesus has proven he was the one that he claimed to be. I want you to understand that Jesus truly is the Savior that is needed by all of humanity. Every person in this room, every person outside of this room. But why? 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 Why, Jesus? Why? He will fill your need. You know, man has a longing of the human heart. There, there is a longing that man has. He tries to fill that longing with so many different things. Solomon talked about this in the book of Ecclesiastes. He takes us on a philosophical journey, and he, he shows how he looked for meaningful, purposeful existence in wine, wealth, women, work, even the acquisition of knowledge. And you know what he said? He said it left him empty. Vanity of vanities, vexation of spirit. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. There is only one who can satisfy eternally in the spiritual realm. And I didn't say that if you trust Christ, everything will be hunky-dory. I, I didn't say that. But I'm telling you, he's the only one that can satisfy the longing of the human heart. He's the only one who can feel that emptiness. That's why he said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. He is the one who satisfies eternally in the spiritual realm. He does. He will fill your need. He will change your life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. 
There are people throughout this room who could step up here right now and testify of the transformative power of salvation, the transformative power of Christ. Christ has changed your life. He has changed my life. You see, I have a desire for church. I have a desire for the Word. I have a desire for prayer. I have a desire to honor the Lord with my life. That's been consistent in my life. Am I saying that I've always said the right thing and and done the right thing? No, no, I'm not saying that at all. I've not always said the right thing, done the right thing, thought the right thing. No, I'm not saying that. But there's a desire that I've had consistently. You know why? Because He changed my life. There are people who say they're Christians, but yet there hasn't been any tangible difference. There's no tangible change. And, and, and I would say to you what Paul said. He said, examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith. Because if you're really in Christ, there's going to be a difference in your life. He will change your life. He will fill your need. And he will give you purpose in life. We quote the verse every, almost every week, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God, Right? We quote that verse, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Now, atheists, people who say there is no God, and you have people who really believe there is no God. You also have a lot of people who say they believe there is no God, but I, I believe that inwardly they believe there is a God. They just simply say that. But you do, you do have people who, I believe, genuinely disbelieve. So, people who say there is no God, many of them, many of them, struggle with three questions. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Where did I come from? If you missed last week, you need to listen to the message because we talked about this some last week, but Colossians chapter 1, 16 and 17. But if you say there is no God, in all likelihood, then you're going to accept the humanistic, secularistic view of the origin of the earth and all that is therein. Simply here by chance, coming from nowhere, coming from nothing, simply here through a naturalistic, unguided, chaotic process. And so you're going to believe that in all likelihood about the origin of the earth and all that is therein, including human life. And so, in all likelihood, you will believe that uh, you're nothing more than an animal and that you evolved from a lower life form. Second question. Why am I here? Well, if there's no God, I better eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Better squeeze as much pleasure out of this life because that's, that's it. You know, the 30, 40, 50, 80, 100 years that I'm on this earth. Why, why should I really give much thought to anything spiritual because it's going to all be over when I breathe my last breath? I better just squeeze as much pleasure out of this life. Third question, where am I going? Well, I guess they're going to take me, place me in a casket, dig a hole in the ground, place the casket in the hole, cover the hole with dirt, or they're going to turn my body to ashes. They're, They'll cremate me or bury me at sea, whatever it may be, and that will be the end of my existence. Now, you contrast that with what people of faith believe, and I'm going to use the word know, what people of faith know in reference to those three questions. Where did we come from? Fearfully, wonderfully made, created in the image of our triune, one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, fearfully, wonderfully made, created in the image of our triune God. And the Bible says that we are made in His image, Genesis 1 and verse 26. Let us make man in our image, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We are three in one spirit, soul, body. We have a physical component. We have a spiritual component. We are special to God according to the teaching of Scripture, made in His very image. Third question, or second question, got ahead of myself. Why am I here? Once again, the verse, to glorify God. Now, let's talk about that just a little bit deeper. 
from last Sunday, remember? Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, we learned that Jesus Christ, not simply a little baby in a manger, and not simply one who died on a cross, but God's divine agent in the creation of the universe, the world, and all that is therein. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Jesus. By him, by Jesus, we are told we were created. In him, through him, by him, and for him. That's what we're told in Colossians 1, 16 and 17. So we were created to know Christ, to love Christ, to worship Christ, to obey Christ, to serve Christ, to proclaim Christ, to know Christ, and to make him known. See, that's how we answer those three questions as people of faith. It is common today, and it's becoming more and more common. I've seen such a change since I started in ministry back in the 80s. Atheism and and the denial of God is is really uh, gaining traction and becoming more and more popular. And oftentimes, as I mentioned several weeks ago, people who say there is no God, no matter how low the IQ may be, and, and once again, you can believe in God and have a low IQ, you can believe in God and have a high IQ. Some of the most brilliant people who have ever lived and who are living right now believe in God. Okay? But you also can have a low IQ and you can have a high IQ if you say there is no God. And there are some brilliant minds, as we would define brilliance, who say there is no God. I'm not denying that. But the problem is, now the Bible has something to say about that, which I'm not going to go into. But the Bible has something to say about that. But as far as how we would define brilliance, we would say, oh, that person, brilliant, and they say there is no God. So it runs the gamut. But oftentimes, no matter how low the IQ of people who say there is no God They look at people of faith like myself, and they consider us to be complete ignoramuses. But let me take you back to the time when I was a teenager. Yes, the dark ages. It's a long time ago. Alexander City, Alabama. Little town, home of Russell Mills, Terrell Owens, famous football player. He's from Alexander City, Alabama. There's some famous people from Alexander City, including your pastor. Alexander City, Alabama. So... There was a period of time when I was a teenager that I had a youth pastor who actually was one of the designers of the space shuttle. Everybody say, ooh, yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, I would, say, I would say if you're one of the designers of the space shuttle, you, you have a certain level of intelligence, right? So he was one of the designers of the space shuttle. He actually at one time worked at the Huntsville Space Center in Huntsville, Alabama. He left that, and he went into pastoral ministry. So he's talking to the teenagers one day, and I never will forget this. I still remember the class. I remember where I was seated. I was on the back row. Had to have the back row back in those days. But there was only two rows, so okay. Anyway, uh, I don't know what it is about the back row, but nevertheless. uh, I was on the back row. still remember, and he was up there teaching. And he said something that I've never forgotten that I, I refer to about three or four times a year. I sound like a broken record to the people who come here all the time with this because it had such an impact upon my life. It's so simplistic. He said, let's say you go through your whole life and you believe the Bible's true. There is a God. Jesus Christ is the Savior of mankind. He died on the cross. He resurrected Uh, You believe there's a heaven, you believe there's a hell, you believe there's a Satan, you believe all of that, and then you get to the end of your life and none of that's true. The Bible's not true, there is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell, Jesus is not the Savior of mankind. Uh, He didn't die on the cross to pay for the sins of mankind, and he didn't resurrect. None of that's true. But you believed it your whole life. This individual by the name of Paul Weeks, he, he he said to the teenagers, he asked us this question. He, he said, what have you lost? And then he answered it. He said, really, you've lost nothing. If you've followed the teaching of Scripture, you've probably lived a longer life because Scripture teaches you to avoid practices which have been proven to cut one's life short. But he turned it around and he said, let's say that 
you go through your whole life and you deny the existence of God. You deny the Bible as being true. You deny that Jesus Christ is the Savior of mankind, that he died on the cross to pay for the sins of mankind, that he resurrected. You deny all of that. You deny a heaven, a hell, a Satan. You get to the end of your life. You've denied it your whole life, and you get to the end of your life, and it's all true. There is a God, there is a heaven, there is a hell. The Bible is true. Jesus is the Savior of mankind. Yes, he died on the cross to pay for the sins of mankind. He resurrected. All of that's true, but you've denied it your whole life. You get to the end of your life, it's true. Then what? You've lost everything. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Oh, well, pastor, any, any world religion could say that. Any, any world religion could say that. But there's only one Jesus who came out of the grave. You see, that's the difference. I serve a risen Savior. There's only one Jesus. The other world religious leaders are in the grave. Jesus proved he was the one that he claimed to be. So here's my challenge. And if I could preach to every person in the world, I think I would basically preach what I've preached today. And that is... The one whose birth we celebrate Saturday, he's not just a little baby in the manger. He's the Savior of mankind, and you need a Savior, and he is your only hope. Not church, not religiosity, not good works. It's only through the one whose birth we celebrate this coming Saturday morning. So if you don't know Christ, what a wonderful time to make your heart a manger for Jesus Christ by trusting Christ and Christ only. That's the only way to be cleansed of your sin. That's the only way to be forgiven. That's the only way to be declared perfect. That's the only way to enter into heaven. Not through any goodness found in yourself. It is only through the one whose birth we celebrate Saturday. The last two weeks, I've sang this little song. I learned it when I was in, uh, I think, St. Petersburg, Florida, written by Ron Hamilton who is in failing health right now. But I love this little song. The miracle of Christmas is that God became a man. He sent a little baby to reveal redemption's plan. The miracle of miracles brings hope to every man. The miracle of Christmas time. Jesus is the reason for the season. He was God, is God, shall forever be God, and He is the only means of salvation proven by His resurrection from the dead. And all God's people said, let's all stand, every head bowed and every eye closed. If you would say, Pastor, there's been a time in my life when I've understood that I was a sinner. I've understood that because of my sin, I deserve to be separated from God. I've understood that Jesus died on a cross to pay for my sin. I heard the gospel, the glad tidings, the good news. And I've called upon Christ to save me. I put my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ. I can say by the authority of God's word, if I were to die today, I would go to heaven because I've called upon Jesus Christ to save me, and he has saved me. I'm claiming what he said in his word. He said he would save me if I called upon him for salvation. I've done that. I can say by the authority of God's word, I'm a child of God. I'm on my way to heaven. If that's true in your life, would you please lift your hand? God bless you. I see those hands. You can lower your hands. I wonder today how many would say, Pastor, I cannot say with absolute certainty that I'm a child of God. I cannot say that I know heaven is my home. Would you raise your hand and I'll not come and embarrass you in any way, shape, form, or fashion. No one's looking except the pastor. I'm not sure that I have everlasting life. I'm not sure that heaven is my home. I'm not sure if I died right now that I would go to heaven. See, today is the day if you've not trusted Christ. Today is the day. This could be the most wonderful Christmas you've ever experienced if you simply make your heart a manger for Jesus Christ. Call upon him to save you. 
He said he would. Jesus said, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And no, it's not just a mental ascent. It's a heart decision, we're told in Romans. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It's not just a mental ascent. It is you trusting Christ as your Savior, casting yourself wholly on that sacrifice, understanding that there is no other means of salvation other than Jesus Christ and his death. So if you've never called upon him to save you, today is the day. We would rejoice with you. And the Bible says that there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that cometh to repentance. So if you've not trusted Christ, I want to invite you to trust him right here in this service. If you have trusted Christ and you just want to come and kneel down, spend some time with the Lord, I encourage you to do that. If you've trusted Christ but you've not been baptized by immersion, come and take my hand. I'll have someone explain to you baptism and what it's all about. Perhaps you'd like to be a part of this fellowship. Just come and take my hand and say, Pastor, I'd like to be a part of this fellowship. Whatever the need might be, as soon as the song begins, step out. Don't hesitate. Come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord. And He will surely give you rest by trusting in His word. Trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you. Let's all sing together. For Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Yes, Jesus is the truth, the way that leads you into be seated. Kim has some announcements for us at this time. All right, we've got several announcements here for you this morning, so we'll get right into it. First up is the youth group outing for lunch today. Pastor and his wife will be taking the youth group out to lunch immediately following the morning service. You can see, Pastor, if you have any questions about that, they will also be providing transportation home following the lunch outing. Next, also for the youth, a busy day for youth today. They will be having a uh, youth Christmas party today at 5 p.m., having a white elephant gift exchange, a pizza party, and a Christmas craft. Please see Lynn Lee if you have any questions. If you're coming to that, see her or text her. Her number is in the bulletin for you. Let them know you're coming. And next is the Christmas card exchange. You surely saw on the way in the tables full of Christmas cards. Those are ready to be picked up today. Pick them up today so you'll have them at home for the holiday season. And a big thank you to those who helped sort those. Laura Fogerson, Pat Keller, Jeanette Porter. We appreciate their help today. Thank you, thank you ladies for your work on that. Quite, quite a task, I'm sure. Uh, next is the Christmas Eve candlelight service coming up this Friday, Christmas Eve, 6 p.m. Just about a 30 minute service, a time of uh, reflecting on the Christmas story, having the candle lighting, singing some Christmas songs. Just a brief service on Christmas Eve. You'll want to be here for that. And then next, we do have some changes to our uh, schedule during the holiday season. 
the life groups, Sunday school and kid men will take, be, be taking a couple of weeks off, as well as Awana and Wednesday evening services. Uh, prayer meeting is not going to happen for the next two weeks. Those will resume Wednesday evening, January 5, for the Wednesday evening act activities, and the Sunday morning, Sunday school hour activities resuming on January 9. And then lastly, we do have a special church conference coming up, uh, January 9, also following the morning service, a special church conference uh, to take a vote on taking on a new missionary, as well as uh, expending some money out of our mission surplus to help a special missionary need, Je uh, January 9, following the morning service. And last, we do have a special announcement from our chairman of deacons, Brother Ed. If you can make your way up, he's got a special presentation for us here today. Take me a little while to get up here. If I could have Pastor Mark and Nell, uh, Malia come over, we would like to present you with something. These are the two people that work in our office. Pastor obviously puts in more hours than you probably ever would think and ever would realize. Malia's working very hard in all the various things she does as well. We greatly appreciate what they do for Bible Baptist Church uh, for us. We have a, a gift here for you and a card. So here's yours, Pastor Mark. And here's yours. And again, thank you for your service to Bible Baptist Church and all that you do for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And I want to say uh, a word of thanks to several people. Uh, Jenny, love it. Is she here today? Oh, that's right, Brandon and Jenny. You might know I was going to praise her when she wouldn't be here. But uh, no, Jenny headed up the decorations this year. And I want to thank her and everybody who helped her, because I know there's quite a few people that helped her. But I was on the interstate. I was out of, heading out of town, so I didn't have any part of that. But thank you all. Uh, thank you, Malia, for the children's program today, the, the singing. And uh, thank you, children. And everyone who helped with that, uh, thank you so much. We love this time of the year. It's all about Jesus Christ, and thank you so much for this gift. I, I appreciate it so much. Love you and appreciate all that you have done for us over the years and all that you are doing. Yes, I, there's one, one more. One forgot. more announcement here that's that right, we missed forgot. this morning is the uh, Christmas caroling coming up this Tuesday evening. Please see Dwayne or Tammy if you have any questions about that. And if you are participating in that, please be sure to sign up on the list. It's very important to have names in advance. Tammy's putting in a lot of time and effort to get this organized. People will have roles to participate in in this uh, mystery outing evening. So be sure and sign up for that. See Dwayne or Tammy if you have any questions. Thank you. All right. And... I want us to sing one more time before we leave today. I know uh, it's right, we're right at the time we normally dismiss, but I want us to sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. So stand up. Let's sing that together. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Glory 
to a newborn king. The doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And for the teenagers who are going out with my wife and myself, if you'll just meet right here so that I can have an idea who all will be going, just meet right here, right where I'm standing. I would appreciate that very much. God bless you. Have a good day. Merry Christmas. Thank you for coming. Hey, John. God rest ye, man.